Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. This is the word of the Lord. May he add his blessings to it. Do you have a tradition that you observe at New Year's? When I was growing up, our extended family would uh, eat out together on New Year's <coughs> Eve every year. Well, that was a time where we didn't eat out near as much, so it's special in that way. But also on New Year's Eve, we would go, all of us, to a restaurant up in Akron. It was a special place we never ate any other time of the year. And we did that as a family just about every year. And when I got a little bit older and went to college and so forth and began to miss out on that uh, family tradition, I really missed it. One of the first times I missed was uh, I was in college and I was with my basketball team. We were in California over New Year's and, and I got deathly sick on that trip uh, with strep throat. It was New Year's Day and I was just miserable all day long uh, in a really nice hotel in Santa Barbara, California. You think, oh, that's really rough. But I was as sick as I've ever been in my life. All, all New Year's Day, everybody else got to go to the Tournament of Roses Parade. I had to stay in that hotel room and uh, I thought, this really stinks. You know, I've only seen this parade on TV. Uh, but I, I really missed being with my family that year because of the situation. And then uh, one year uh, after that, we traveled to uh, Israel with a group and was in Israel over New Year's. And I loved just about everything about that trip, but I really didn't like being with, without my family uh, when the clock struck midnight. You know, no kiss from the wife. I'm sure she missed that even more than I did, but um, you know we all have our traditions and and things we like to do on New Year's. I was surprised when I discovered that that some of the ancient peoples mentioned in the Bible uh, often had some kind of New Year tradition as well. Uh, for instance, the Babylonians had a big New Year festival that they observed. It was called the Akitu Festival, and it actually occurred in what we would understand to be the spring of the year, uh, our calendars being different. But for them, it was a very religious time, full of all kinds of rituals, and, and some of them are, are uh, quite interesting. There would be a lot of prayers that, that were offered up during this time. And in fact, a lot of baptisms, they, they may not have called it that, but they would do, have ritual uh, purifications that they would do at this time of the year, at New Year's time. And, and then they would, they would retell the story of creation as they understood it, uh, how the world was created. And the hero of that story in Babylon was a god known as Marduk. Uh, Marduk was sort of the, the conquering warrior. He, according to their mythology, had won a big battle among the gods, and he then founded the great city of Babylon. Uh, Marduk would, would later come to be known as Bel, B-E-L, and you can see that name in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 1. And we'll read that passage here in a moment. But after the, the, the story of Marduk was rehearsed and, and the creation story was told, the king of Babylon 
would, would make his way to the temple sanctuary in the city, and uh, some interesting things would take place there. He would be stripped of his royal garments by the priest, and then the priest would do some surprising things. He would actually slap the king in the face. You can be sure that that was the only time that happened all year long. But he would slap the king in the face, and then he would grab his ears, the king's ears, and yank on them. And this was a way, the slapping and the yanking of, of humiliating the king in the presence of the god that they were worshiping, the god Marduk. Well, the king would then pledge his allegiance to the great god of Babylon, and he would swear his loyalty for the coming year, and then the king would get his clothes back, and then the priest would get to slap him again. In fact, he would get to slap him as many times as it would take until tears began to actually fall down the king's face. This was a way of symbolizing his repentance, his humility before the God. Later in the day, uh, there would be a parade where the king would, would march and he would sort of hold the hand of the idol, Marduk, and, and show his partnership with the God, his submission to the God. Now that's... Uh, might make you ask, why take time to go through all that, this ancient festival? We read a moment ago from uh, the prophet Isaiah, and when you get to this section of Isaiah, which is sort of the second part of the prophet Isaiah, it's chapters 40 through 55, what's going on there is God, through the prophet, is speaking to the Jews who are in exile in Babylon. That's the setting. And remember, they had been, their, their nation had been destroyed and they had been carried away into Babylonian captivity. They're there in chapters 40 through 55. God is speaking to them. And so for many decades, for a generation, actually more than a generation, um, the people, the Jews living in Babylon had seen all these Traditions, they had seen this New Year festival many times um, that celebrated the gods of the Babylonians. God is trying to call these people to leave that, to leave Babylon and go back home to Israel. And frankly, many of them are not interested in doing so. They want to stay. We might think, oh, why wouldn't you want to go back? You're a conquered people, but they had been there uh, as long as they could remember. Not many wanted to return. They've settled in this new place. They've settled in this new culture, and they're probably satisfied, a lot of them, with their setting and maybe with their new gods in, in a lot of cases. And I just wonder, in reflecting on that, if there is not a true parallel with our situation today. Are we not, as Christians, aliens and exiles in this world? Isn't that the language of Scripture that we read? Isn't that what we read in the New Testament? And, and even in the society that I feel we're blessed to live in, in the United States, which you know, a lot of things we love about uh, where we live, but when we get real honest and we look around and we see what our society is really all about these days, don't we understand even more that this world is not our home, that we are just passing through? Is God not calling us home too? Do you think our God is concerned that we're too comfortable where we live and when we live? Do you think God might think that, that we have bought into some of the idols that our culture bows down to? Let's read some more verses here 
in Isaiah chapter 46. We read verses 8, 9, and 10 earlier, but let's start at the beginning of the chapter and read down to verse 8. Isaiah 46, verse 1. Bell bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are borne as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god, then they fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders, they carry it, they set it in its place and it stands there it cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it does not answer or save him from his trouble. It's one of the great passages in the prophets that ridicules practice of idolatry. Uh, and, and Isaiah often does that if you read the length of his book. But you pick up there on how he ridicules the practice he names a couple of the Babylonian gods, again, Bel, uh, there in verse 1, that is Marduk, which was sort of their chief god. And, and then he also mentions in verse 1 this god Nebo, N-E-B-O, who was Marduk's son, and he was considered their god of wisdom, the Babylonians' god of wisdom. But did you notice what the text says they're doing? They're being carted around. They're being carried, maybe in a parade uh, like we described earlier. But who is carrying them around? It's the people who worship them. It's the Babylonians. How ridiculous is that picture, you see? The great gods that they worship, that they remember and devote themselves to, have to be carried by those who worship them and pray to them. And even then, Isaiah says, they're all stooped over. They're, they're bowing down. They're not proud gods. They're not powerful. They seem to be defeated. They're actually being carried away into captivity. Down in verses 6 and 7, the prophet goes on even further in his mockery of, of them. How ridiculous a situation it is where you have a person who takes gold and silver, their, their money, and employs a sculptor who builds him an idol, and then they fall down before that creation of theirs and worship it. And, and they carry it around on their shoulders or maybe in a cart and they move their God, the one they believe in, the one they worship from here to there. It can't move on its own. It's immobile. The God is totally dependent on the worshiper. The idol cannot hear the prayers that are being directed to it. It can't respond to them, can't rescue them when they're in trouble. So it's just sort of devastating logic that's used here. Why would anyone do something as foolish as this? God says to these exiled Jews, these idols are nothing. In fact, he says, I'm sending a bird of prey from the east. This is way down in verse 11. To wipe them out and to conquer Babylon. Now, historically, that would turn out to be King Cyrus of Persia, who uh, uh, Isaiah has already named specifically a couple of times, even though it's many years before he was even born. 
The message to the Jewish exiles is this. Why would you stay in Babylon when I'm about to wipe it out? Why are you so fascinated with Babylonian ways and customs and religion when you could follow my ways, when you could worship me, the one true God? Verse 5 of the text, God says, there's no one to compare me to. No one is equal to me. The most compelling thing to me in this passage is God says uh, through Isaiah, it's still a great question for us to consider today. God says, these people, they carry their idols around all over the place, but Israel, I've carried you all along. From your birth to your old age, I have carried you. You don't carry me. You didn't make me. I made you. You don't carry me. I carry you. I save you. You don't save me. This is really, I think, still the thrust of the message for us today. Here's the question. Who's carrying who? Do you carry your gods or does your God carry you? I hope you see how important the answer to that question is. Do you carry your gods or does your God carry you? And someone might say, well, yeah, but we don't have gods like the Babylonians had. We don't have idols today. Oh, no? Are you sure? We had an entire show called American Idol. It was a giant hit. It may still be on, I don't know. Don't we sometimes worship People with great talent like that in our society? Aren't we a celebrity culture in many ways? How about athletes? How about sports teams? There's an awful lot of devotion to, to things like that in our society in the United States. I would guess that there are more people at the ball fields this morning than there are in church and maybe some of our people. We could make quite a list, couldn't we, of little idols people carry around. I could make a list for you. I might be afraid to list mine. Yeah, we find ourselves in the midst of a seemingly never-ending political season Again, notice how that season has stretched out and it seems to be always now. Election season, political season. Politics is so pervasive in the United States, it's so in our face. And, and to some people in our culture, politics is absolutely everything. It is their religion. And that influences us. And so depending on how elections go or how decisions come down or, or what laws are passed or what laws are rescinded, people think it's the end of the world or it's the start of a, a bright new age of justice because my way happened. Brothers and sisters, I've read this from start to finish, and I don't see that concern in the Word of God. I don't see any concern with the politics of the United States of America in this book. Now, I'm as interested in politics as anybody, I think. Just ask my wife and daughters how much I read and, and watch that stuff. 
And I don't, I'm not saying that there's zero importance in it. I'm interested in it. But if I, if I depend on the United States government to make things right, or on my political party or my president to promote justice and rightness in this world, then I tell you, I think I'm, I'm guilty of carrying my idols around and not letting my God carry me. God says here, I carry you. You don't carry me. He says, I have carried you from the womb. And I will carry you into your old age. That's good enough for me. At least it should be. Who's carrying who? The conclusion again, verse 8. God says, remember this. Stand firm. Recall it to mind. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. God is still calling his people out of Babylon. Out of devotion to the things of this world and into a fully dependent relationship upon him. And I hope we are hearing and heeding his call. He's calling us out, folks. Let's pray to him. Loving Father, your goodness is so great. We are so dependent on you for life and breath and everything just help us to realize it call us away from the things of this world help us to offer the world a better way your way and help us just not to love it too much here because you have such great things in store for us thank you for your love in Christ for the hope of eternity of resurrection body and life in your presence and help us to live toward that we pray in jesus our savior's name amen this morning if you need prayers for the service of, of the church in some way help in your walk we offer a time for you to reflect on that think about it and to respond while we stand and while we sing this song